folks, if you're joining us uh, for the first time, uh, you are very welcome. This is the weekly Apologetics Academy, which I run every Saturday at 8 p.m. Uh, UK time, which corresponds to 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 12 noon Pacific. And every week I bring in a different scholar, speaker, expert, apologist to present to us a topic of interest to Christians, particularly pertaining to apologetics. Um, we bring in Christian and non-Christian guests to present to us uh, about arguments for and against Christianity. We also critique and cross-examine other worldviews, and we're all interested in the pursuit of truth, uh, what is um, true, um, what is true about reality, uh, and, and how, how do we form a consistent and coherent and correct and cogent worldview. And, uh, this evening, we are blessed to have Dr. Robert Marx, who is... Um, a well-known personality in the intelligent design community in particular. He's based at Baylor University and uh, he's, uh, he's a bit of a polymath and he is uh, this evening going to be talking to us about uh, the nature of omniscience. Um, I'm not um, quite familiar with the argument that he's going to be presenting so I'll be learning this probably for the first time as well so I look forward to hearing what uh, Dr. Marks has to say. Dr. Marks, do you want to maybe just start by introducing yourself and just kick into your presentation? Yeah, sure. Um, I am um, to, first of all delighted to be here. It's always it's always good to be among uh, people who talk about things which are incredibly important, and we're going to be talking about some of those important things today. So thank you for the invitation, and it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I am a, I am a follower of Christ. I became a Christian when I was a junior in college. And we could we could have a long talk about that, but basically I discovered that, like Blaise Pascal said, there was a God-shaped vacuum inside me that could only be filled through uh, the salvation of Christ. So I've been a follower of Christ since then, and I'm really interested in apologetics because I think that um, when many people come to Christ, they, they, they come and they don't know everything. When, when I talk to people about Christ, I, I say, sometimes you don't have to understand everything to make the step towards uh, accepting Christ. And that indeed was the case with me. But no other than, um, than uh, Stephen Hawking said that we never prove anything in physics. Rather, what we do is we accumulate evidence and I think that's the same thing for the Christian faith. And that's where apologetics comes in. We are accumulating evidence for our faith. And indeed, if our faith in Christ and, and uh, his role in terms of our salvation is true, then any of the things that we look at are going to only glorify God more. So that's one of the reasons that I'm interested in apologetics. And now I have developed evidence through apologetics where some of these uncertainties are, are gone. And I believe without a doubt now that there is a God, that that God is the God of the Bible, that Christ was his son, that Christ died for us and uh, died for his sins. So that's my background. I spent um, professionally 26 years at the University of Washington in Seattle. And there was a, there's a great man, one of my heroes, Walter Bradley, who uh, was at Baylor University and invited me to come to Baylor. And when he invited me, he said Baylor was trying to do something that no other university had ever tried to do, which was to try to uh, become a serious research university. And that's where God has gifted me in terms of research in my field and also celebrate the Lordship of Christ. So like any institution that's Christian, Baylor has its bumps, but it's a place I can still pray with students. I can be very open about my faith and we can do great and wonderful things here. So um, I don't think there's any place in the world I'd rather be right now. So that's kind of, uh, kind of the background. I've been here since 2003 after the University of Washington and are really, really enjoying it. So with that, let me share my screen. I want to first of all pitch... Uh, pitch a book that's going to come out maybe in one month or uh, one or two months from now, published by World Scientific. It's called Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics. It's by William Densky, Winston Ewart, and Jonathan told me that Winston is in the audience tonight, so hopefully we can, we can hear from Winston in a little bit. Uh, it, it, this is a very interesting book, uh, building on some of the ideas of William Densky. Uh, we have done a number of interesting things. Number one, we have codified the idea of information and search, that the evolutionary search that is done on computers can only be done when it's infused with uh, information from the programmer. 
And not only have we talked about that, but we have the ability to measure it and measure the amount of information which is infused in terms of bits. One of the programs that we analyzed was Avida. Avida is a popularly used computer program which claims to simulate evolution and was also instrumental in the Dover trial where Judge Jones handed down the ruling that intelligent design was a religion. One of the co-authors of Avida, um, Pinnock, I believe it was, made a testimony that yes, not only did Avida work, but uh, Avida was not an instantiation or an example of evolution, but it was evolution. And one of the things that we talk about in this book is how we measured the amount of information that the programmers of Avida put into the, into the process and actually were able to measure it in bits. Some of the other things that, that are happening uh, in the book are the ability to measure specified complexity. We all know that when we look at Mount Rushmore, we see design as opposed to when we look at Mount Fuji. But what's the theory behind that? What's the mathematics behind that? In the book, there's actually a development of an idea called algorithmic specified complexity that can actually look at a designed element and tell the degree to which it is designed and actually measure it in bits. So therefore, we have, um, we have developed kind of the mathematics behind some of these things. And I always have to downplay the mathematics in here. We, we wrote the book uh, kind of akin to Michael Behe, when Michael B. he wrote Darwin's Black Box, he put little X's by all of the places where he got into deep, ugly detail about biochemistry. And I, when I read Darwin's Black Box, I skipped all of those because I, you know, I don't have that background. We've done the similar thing in the Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics. We have actually put little tags by all of the heavy math and written the book at a high level so that those that want to read it can actually... Uh, can actually read it without a deep knowledge of, of mathematics. That always scares away people, but it, it really shouldn't. Mathematics is fun. So let me, uh, let me talk about omniscience. This is kind of a standalone project. This really doesn't relate to evolutionary, inf well, it does in a way. It, it relates to algorithmic specified complexity. Assuming a consistent reality with no contradictions, there can exist at most one omniscient being and that by necessity, this being must exist outside of time and space. That's a radical, radical concept, but it comes from a very simple assumption, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this paper actually comes from, from this paper that you see here. It was published by the American uh, Scientific Affiliation, their journal, because it was, it was clearly theistic and had to, uh, ha had to do with God. We do run a website, it's evoinfo.org, E-V-O-I-N-F-O.org, and reprints of our papers are all available there, including, including this one, which is, which is a fun sort of paper. I think you'll find that it's fun. We'll see. There is an incredible power in apologetics and mathematics and philosophy and so-called meta-analysis. What do we mean by meta-analysis? Meta means self-reference. It means that you are actually taking a statement and you are, are, are do a little feedback loop and you, uh, you analyze the statement with the statement. For example, uh, meta-statements can be true. I can say this sentence has five words. Notice there is the uh, reference back to the statement, this sentence has five words. And indeed, that's true. This sentence does have five words. Very curious, very curious way of doing things. It can also be false. Uh, for example, I can say this sentence has 20 words and that's false. But these meta statements have an incredible logical consequence, which we'll deal with. Meta statements can be incomplete. There is the old story about the barber in the small town that shaved everybody who did not shave themselves. And Th this brings up a paradox. It's a meta statement because when you apply the statement to itself, you ask yourself, well, who shaved the barber? And there's actually two responses to that. One is that the, the, the statement is incomplete. It doesn't specify who shaved the barber. The other explanation is that the barber was a woman <laughs> and didn't shave. Uh, that isn't used very much, but indeed that, that is a possibility. So that's a meta statement. When we apply it to itself, we get 
we, we get kind of incompleteness, if you will. There's a statement in Titus that says the Cretans are always liars. If that Cretan says everything I say is a lie, well, all of a sudden, if you apply a meta-analysis to it, well, if everything he said was a lie, then he just lied. And if he just lied, what he said was the truth. But if it was the truth, it was a lie. But if he lied, it was the truth. So it goes back and forth, and you go through this uh, bipolar sort of um, uh, thought process where he lies, he doesn't lie, he, doesn't, he lies, he doesn't lie. So this is a very interesting consequence of a self, um, self-reference, a meta-statement, if you will. A meta statements can be curious. I don't know what to say about this meta statement, but if somebody comes up and said this meta statement is true, um, I don't know if that's profound, if it's stupid, or what it is. But nevertheless, it is a statement because it refers to itself. So meta statements can be curious. Meta meta analysis can be amusing, and we see meta sort of statements all the time in in cartoons, and when we take the statement of the cartoon and apply it to the situation in the cartoon, it becomes funny. Like we have here, Dr. Fisk's amnesia patients are all offered money back guarantees. The idea here is that if he has amnesia patients and he doesn't cure the amnesia patients, then they'll forget about the guarantee. Uh, This is a fun one. Former skeptic William Butterfield is now skeptical of skepticism. So if you apply the skeptic's idea, they're usually skeptic of Christianity, but they're never... They're never, it seems, um, skeptical of their own skepticism. Uh, Here's another one uh, from Shakespeare. There is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And then if you ask the question, isn't that bad? You say yes, and then you say, I think. So applying the statement to itself actually gives a type of contradiction. This is a fun one. Nothing is written in stone. And the irony, of course, is that nothing is written in stone is written in stone there. So it's a, when you apply the meta statement to itself, it's just kind of weird. And then this one, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not sure. Um, that's also a meta statement. So you can see that meta, meta analysis is used in cartoons quite a bit. And we find it some, for some reason to be very, very amusing. I find it very amusing. Metathod can help reveal numerous self-refuting philosophies. This is used in apologetics book. We, we went through Frank Turek's book, I Don't Have Faith Enough to Be an Atheist, and he talked about uh, the so-called roadrunner technique where you take an argument of an atheist and you turn it around on itself and actually show that the argument is stupid. And you've seen these sort of things before. Uh, one of them I love from C.S. Lewis is that since there is evil, there is no moral God. This is, this is in the debate about, uh, about morality. Well, if there is no moral God, how do you know what is good and evil? How do you determine exactly what is good and evil? So again, it's a meta-analysis. It's taking the statement, and it's applying it to itself. Here's another one. Don't impose your stupid religious beliefs on me. Uh, We're getting this more and more in the United States right now. And of course, the irony is, is that by saying that, the person saying it is imposing their religious beliefs on somebody else. And you get that again from the meta-analysis from applying the statement to itself. There's a story that Ravi Zacharias tells when he was talking with a Hindu philosopher and they went out to dinner and there was the argument that there is no absolute truth, there is no right and wrong, everything is relative. And at the end of the dinner, Ravi Zacharias says, and you think you're right, that there is no right and wrong. The guy says, yeah, I'm, I'm right and you're wrong. So just the idea of defending this philosophy becomes self-refuting because, it, uh, because we're applying meta-analysis and the self-refuting nature uh, gives you the contradiction. So there is no absolute right and wrong. All is relative. I disagree. Well, you're wrong and you're right. Absolutely. So even those that argue that there is no right and wrong by applying this meta-analysis, they can be proven to be, uh, logically inconsistent, if you will. Let's see. Oh, here's, here's what we get from scientism. Only things proven by science can be believed this is, a, this is a philosophy um, given by some. And, of course, 
when you apply that statement to itself, can you prove this scientifically? No, it's a, it's a statement of philosophy. It isn't a statement of science. So therefore, by itself, the statement is self-refuting when you apply this meta-analysis. Now, we can actually get very serious because meta-analysis has very serious applications in the area of mathematics. One is Barry's paradox. Uh, if I remember right, this was actually proposed to Bertrand Russell by his barber as a very interesting problem, and I guess the barber's name was Barry. And he said, uh, let's do the following. Let's define a number X, and let's let X be the smallest natural number that requires no more than 20 words to define. Let X be the smallest number that requires no more than 20 words to define. And what would that number be? When you say let X be the smallest natural number that requires no more than 20 words to define, that sentence by itself has defined X use only, only 15 words. So, therefore, we, we have a paradox here. There does exist no number that requires more than, no more than 20 words to define. Because in that sentence, we only use 15 words and we have already defined the number. The curious part about this, it might seem just kind of a uh, humorous paradox, but actually there's a depth of truth in this if you go into algorithmic information theory. If you go into algorithmic information theory, there's something called Kolmogorov complexity, which uh, corresponds to the shortest computer program that gives you an output. And that shortest computer program is unknowable. And it's unknowable because of the same reason that Barry's paradox is weird. Uh, so, therefore, it does have serious ramifications in the area of uh, algorithmic information theory and so-called Kolmogorov complexity, which I won't get into. Just take my word for it right now. Oh, here's my favorite. I want you to think about this because I go to sleep with nightmares about this statement. Meta statements can be mind-bending. Here is something called Curie's paradox. Curie said, if this sentence is true, then Germany borders China. If this sentence is true, there's your meta statement because it refers back to the sentence itself. If this sentence is true, then Germany borders China. Now, the question is, is this a true sentence or is this a, not a true sentence? Clearly, Germany does not border China. But is the statement itself true? If this sentence is true, then Germany borders China. If you... Google Curie's paradox and go to Wikipedia, they will prove that using logic that indeed this is a true statement. Those of you that have a background in math know that one way to prove something is to assume something and then go through the proof and show that there's a contradiction. Here's one of my favorite proofs, uh, and this is whimsical, this is not solid mathematics. But here's a theorem, and that theorem says all integers are interesting. Now, can we prove that all integers are interesting? And we will assume now all positive integers. I should have put all positive integers are interesting. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to assume that there is a smallest uninteresting integer. If there is an uninteresting integer or a group of them, then there is a smallest un interesting integer. So that's the assumption. So we're assuming that there is, that uh, we do have uninteresting integers. Hmm, that's interesting. So the fact that there's a smallest uninteresting integer is interesting, and so you have a proof by contradiction. So therefore, we have proved by uh, this idea of contradiction that all integers are interesting. You probably didn't know that before. Meta-analysis toppled mathematics in the 1930s. There was this grand challenge put out by David Hilbert, which says that we could develop, essentially, all mathematics by making some basic axiomatic fundamental assumptions. And from those assumptions, we could build all mathematics. And Bertrand Russell and John Whitehead wrote what I have heard called the most important unread book in the history of book writing. It was called Principle Mathematica, where they had taken some assumptions and they had attempted to develop all of mathematics. 
and they published two volumes called Principia Mathematica. And they were attempting to do what David Hilbert said they should do, which was to develop all of mathematics. Until in, in the 1930s, uh, Kurt Gödel, who was a little nerdy guy from Austria, came up and he proved through meta-analysis that what Whitehead and Russell were doing was simply not possible. And here is an idea. This is from the comic XKCD. If you haven't looked at them, there's some clever stuff. There's some terrible stuff there, too. But they have these little stick figures and do these nerdy sort of cartoons. But we have these two people uh, on the cartoon on the right, and it's say, hey, Girdle, we're compiling a comprehensive list of fetishes. What turns you on? And Girdle's comment was, anything not on your list. Now, all of a sudden, how do you include anything not on your list on the list? So again, because of this self, um, self-reference, we see immediately that, uh, that making this list is futile if Gödel participates. Now, here's the way that Gödel proved his algorithm. This is a great simplification, but he proved that when Whitehead and uh, Bertrand Russell were developing their math, that they would essentially, that they would eventually come to what I'm going to call here theorem X. And theorem X says that theorem X cannot be proven. Theorem X says that theorem X cannot be proven. Now, first of all, notice the self-reference here. And this is, again, what, what toppled this idea of a universal mathematics from basic foundations. Let's look at the possibilities here. If theorem X cannot be proven, if this theorem is true, then there are things within the system that can't be proven. So therefore, your theory will be incomplete. There are things which you cannot prove outside of uh, the system that you developed, if this is true. If it's false, then the system you develop is inconsistent. Therefore, Gödel essentially proved that all systems that you develop either have to be inconsistent, which would be if this if the system was false, if the system was false and you could prove the theorem theorem X. If this theorem is true, then there's something outside of the axioms, the the fundamental assumptions that you made initially that you do not have the ability to prove. So that was Gödel's idea. As you saw on the previous slide, he he got so famous for doing this. He's listed, I think, on everybody's list of the most important mathematicians of the 20th century. And he ended up, Gödel ended up at the Princeton Institute. And you can see he was good buddies with Einstein. And they wrapped around a long time together. Good people. Now, from this idea of self-reference, there was a book written by Douglas Hofstetter a number of years ago called Gödel, Escher, and Bach. And it was basically addressing these strange sort of phenomena that you get when you have self-reference. Now, we know about Gödel a little bit. Uh, who was Escher? Escher was the guy that, um, that drew very strange cartoons. One is on the right here. And you'll notice on the right that we have some people climbing upstairs, and then we have people climbing downstairs. And the people climbing downstairs keeps on going forever. It's, it's a loop which continues forever. You keep going down, but really, what are you doing? You're in a loop. Same thing for the people going upstairs. Uh, the people going upstairs. I guess you can see my marker here. So we have the people going upstairs, and it looks like they keep going upstairs, but they're in a loop. So he did these strange sort of things, which uh, uh, Hofstetter called strange loops. And you'll notice we have a strange loop here. And we had a strange loop when we, when, when we talked about the idea of all Cretans are liars. We had a loop there, didn't we? Well, if I lied, I told the truth. But if I told the truth, I just lied. But if I just lied, I told the truth. So it's a loop that goes around. And Hofstetter called these a uh, strange loop. Bach is in there because he apparently wrote a piece which sounded like it, um, it was uh, continually rising in pitch, but it wasn't. I have an example that I like better, which I'm going to play for you now. It's called the uh, Shepherd Tone Oral Illusion. It's a glissando, and it's a tone, which is actually a loop, 
that sounds like it's descending forever. Now, we know we can't have a tone that always goes down because sometimes it has, it's going to hit a frequency that we simply can't hear. But it's uh, not an optical illusion. It's not an optical illusion like Escher has, but rather it is an audio illusion. So let's see if I can get this here. But also, as you look at the um, as you look at the spectrum, you can actually see that there is a periodicity here. There is a loop. That is the frequencies as they start from the right and go to the left. That those patterns repeat each other. So this is actually a periodic sort of function. Well, clearly this is not Bach, but it is something which shows kind of a strange loop in. Uh, audio, which what Hofstetter was trying to do by introducing Bach. Now, here, here's here's one of the takeaways that we have from what we've talked we've talked about is that strange loops do not exist in reality. Strange loops do not exist in reality. So, strange loops do not exist in reality, whether they be the audio, the pictures, or the uh, or the humor, even. Now, this gets us to omniscience, which is the title of the talk, and I'm going to apply this idea of strange loops to omniscience. We'll consider only binary oracles. So if we have something which is omniscient, we should be able to go to that omniscient oracle, ask it anything, and that oracle will be knowledgeable about what happened. And we'll restrict ourselves for simplicity of analysis to just ideas that... Uh, that are answered yes and no, binary oracles. So therefore, our oracles are something which we can only ask yes and no questions. Now, we will say that Alice has Bob omniscience. Alice has Bob omniscience if she can answer yes and no questions about Bob. So here's Alice, here's Bob. If Alice is omniscient over Bob, then any question which is asked to Alice about Bob she should be able to answer if indeed she is Bob omniscient. Now, just to set the ground rules correctly, we can't have uh, subjective questions. We can't have questions like, will Agent 89 be more beautiful than Agent 86 tomorrow? That's a very subjective question in terms of yes and no answers. And we'll have no stupid questions. Will Agent 23 ever weigh more than love? Well, that that's stupid because you can't, because love doesn't weigh anything. Uh, or is Agent 007 leafy? Well, you know, what does, it, what, does that, what does that mean? So in other words, no stupid questions, no subjective questions. The other thing that we must make sure about in this omniscient is that there are no strange loops which are allowed. Now here's an interesting question just about knowing yourself. But here's a question to Bob. Can Bob be omniscient about himself? What if we ask Bob the interesting question, will you respond no to this question? It might seem like a whimsical uh, question, but indeed there's, there, there's some deepness there. Well, will you respond no to this question? If Bob answers no, well, he's, he's, he's got a problem. If he answers yes, he has a problem. So here is a statement which actually is an illustration, one example of where Bob cannot be omniscient over himself. Weird. Now we actually have this in Bible. In the Bible, we have a similar sort of problem. And uh, I think we can resolve some things from, from Scripture here. In Mark 10, 27, the second part of it, you're all familiar with the phrase, with God all things are possible. Well, let's apply meta-analysis to this simple idea. If all things are possible, then it should be possible for God to create something impossible for him to do. If all things are possible, it should be possible for God 
to, cre to create a situation that is impossible for him to do. So how do we resolve this? Does this discredit the Bible in some way? No, because as you see in the top here, meta statements can require, require clarifying context. Restricting his actions to his chosen nature allows God to be logically consistent. So therefore, if God is logically consistent, he cannot be logically inconsistent. He has to be totally consistent. He is immune from the logical quagmire of statements that appear on the surface to be self-refuting. But are we then to conclude these restrictions and pose limitations on God? Uh, absolutely, to the extent that God cannot be contrary to his nature. That's something that he cannot do. And requiring this constraint removes the strange loops from God being omniscient over himself. God has self-imposed limitations. Perfection is limited to being perfect. So if God is perfect, then he can't be non-perfect. Now let's go to the second level of this. Let's have two binary oracles. And here are our two binary oracles. One is Alice, one is Bob. And we're going to see if Alice can be omniscient over Bob and Bob can be omniscient over Alice simultaneously. Can they both be omniscient over each other? Well, here's, here's something which suggests they can't. If we ask Bob and Alice simultaneously, as the questions are here, is Bob's next response, no. And then Bob is asked, is Alice's next response, yes. And the question is, what happens there? Well, it turns out that the assumption of this bilateral sort of omniscience leads to a strange loop. It can't happen. And here are the details. These, by the way, these ideas become very kind of mind-stretching. You have to sit down in a quiet room and think about them for a while, at least I do. But if Alice answers yes, she is saying that Bob will predict that she will say no, <laughs> which is contradictory to, to the questions. If Alice answers no, she is saying that Bob will reply yes, thus predicting that Alice will respond yes, but she did not say yes that's producing another contradiction. So therefore, in this idea of Bob being omniscient and over Alice and Alice being omniscient over Bob, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't have that simultaneously. Now, what can we have? We can have Alice being omniscient over Bob because the problem is, is this bilateral, this two-way sort of omniscience. So we can have Alice being omniscient over Bob and in doing so have absolutely none of these strange loops. Correspondingly, Bob can obviously be omniscient over Alice. What about if we add Edgar down here at the bottom? Uh, here's a here's a triple set. Now, if you want to if you want to reason through this, go to the paper. All all of the reasoning is in the paper. Question to Alice is Bob's next response yes. Question to Bob is Edgar's next response yes. And question to Edgar is Alice's response no. It turns out that this is indeed something which forms a strange loop. So it means that Alice can't be omniscient over Bob while Bob is omniscient over Edgar while Edgar is omniscient over Bob. Now, one of the things in engineering that is very interesting here is that there is a feedback loop. Notice that Edgar being omniscient over Alice actually forms a little loop if we follow these omniscience arrows that actually does a loop around the uh, different possibilities. And because of this loop, it turns out to be a strange loop and we get these contradictions, and therefore this cannot happen. But if, if we change one of these arrows, say we, we remove the feedback, we take Edgar being omniscient over Alice and replace it with Alice being omniscient over Edgar, everything is okay. But notice we have totally removed any of the loops. So there are no feedback loops in the sense of engineering or control theory, and there are also no strange logic loops. So this is a possibility. So to avoid strange loops, we're going to get a little technical here, just bear with me. To avoid strange loops, omniscient flow must be, uh, in graph theory, something called a feed-forward graph. In other words, there's no feedback. One way that we learn to do this is we take all of the agents. So here we have Bob and Alice and Edgar, and we're just going to number them from one to nine here. We have nine agents here. 
And we are going to require that a number five not have an arrow to any lower number. So five can only point to six, seven, eight, and nine. Doing so avoids any possibility of feedback. So one can connect to anything. Two can connect to anything but one. Three can connect to anything except one and two, etc. And with that, we can fill in the graph. And with that, we have no feedback loops, number one, but we also have no strange logical loops. So this is this, what I just put on the screen here is explaining this numbering of the different nodes. We number the nodes and we don't let a higher numbered node connect to a lower numbered node. <clears throat> here is the interesting observation about that. Suppose that we have this omniscience graph, locally omniscient. Two is omniscient over three, two is omniscient over seven, etc. We can always put in an omniscience node, which we will call zero up here. Zero is smaller than any of the other nodes. And we can connect this zero node to all of the other different nodes and still not have a feedback mechanism. So there can exist a person omniscient over everybody and not require a feedback loop and not allow strange loops, recognizing that strange loops are indeed uh, something which doesn't exist. Now, here, here's an interesting thing. Let's assume that omniscience changes with respect to time. I mean, if we talk about mortality, people die, people are born. And so here we have snapshots of, of different agents uh, here, for example, we have Bob in the second later, later in time, we have Bob has died. And then we have a new guy coming up. Let's see, where's the new guy? I think there's a new guy that comes up somewhere. The omniscience can actually change with respect to time. So here, zero is omniscient. If we go over here, we can actually have six being omniscient. So six all of a sudden uh, goes out and it can actually be omniscient. And the way that this graph is done, there are no feedback loops. There is no, there are no strange loops. So the omniscience can change. But one of the things that we haven't talked about is avoidance of strange loops in time, which is the next thing we do. So let's do that. Okay. On, on the left here, we have young Bob and then we have old Bob. What about young Bob and old Bob asking themselves questions? in time. Question to young Bob, will old Bob's response be no? And question to old Bob, was young Bob's response yes? This is very similar to the sort of questions that we asked previously. Well, believe it or not, this forms a strange, uh, a strange loop. And therefore, uh, th this is non-answerable. Here are the detailed, uh, the details about why this is a strange loop. And we do have a strange loop now, except this strange loop exists in time. And I won't go over these because they're kind of mind numbing. And I think if, if we get into the details of this, it becomes it was kind of boring. If you're interested in the details, please go to the paper and you're able to, uh, you'll be able to sort this out if you're, if you're interested in doing so. So therefore, we have to be careful of strange loops in time. So that means if we have a system in the past and a system in the future, and we have omniscience arrows just like we did before, that there can be no feedback uh, happening. And I have done here exactly what we did before. We numbered the nodes and no big node can feed back to a node with a smaller number. So therefore the node eight is on the left here and node eight in the past is a node over which node seven is omniscient. Kind of interesting. But even with the flow of time, there can be an omniscience which is placed in the system and require no strange feedbacks and have total logical consistency. So on the left here, we have the mortal system that is flowing with respect to time. Here we can have a omniscience. And this omniscience now points to all of the different nodes. There is no feedback loop. There are no strange loops which occur. And everything is logically consistent. 
But notice something interesting. The way we have drawn it is this omniscience exists outside of time. This omniscience must look forward, both forward and backward in time in order to establish its global omniscience. And that's basically the, the, the premise of the paper, is that indeed we can have omniscience in space and time, and this omniscience must exist outside of time in order to be totally omniscient over the entire timeline. So here's the takeaways. I'm almost done with the talk. This, by the way, is another picture by Escher, and it's one of these boxes which are physically impossible to build. That's what uh, Escher was really good at doing. So here are the takeaways. Self-refuting statements are powerful tools to demonstrate the inval in invalidity of flawed propositions, and strange loops result from such considerations do not exist. Consider uh, Strange loops do not exist. They're rather a logical uh, sort of fantasy. By avoiding strange loop in questions proposed by one agent about another, we have argued that there can exist at most a single omniscient being, and this being must necessarily exist outside of both time and space. Third, the strange loop model demonstrates logical consistency of biblical claims concerning monotheism and timeless omniscience. We can only have one universally omniscient being. With this, let me give you the uh, things which we did not prove. This exercise neither proves the existence of God nor refutes atheism. Uh, there can be at most one globally omniscient being in time and space. It doesn't say that that being exists. And the other thing, it does also not uh, knock down Hinduism because it doesn't exclude the possibility of multiple non-omniscient gods. Certainly within this logical framework, these things are possible. So that is my, uh, that's my talk, and I'll turn it back to Jonathan now for any questions or any discussion that you might want to have concerning this. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mark. If you want to I'm on your screen so we can see you better. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm not done with the, uh, okay. There we oh, okay. Go. <laughs> Well, folks, uh, this is uh, the interactive portion of the program. If you'd like to submit a question for Dr. Mark, you can submit it via the Q&A box, um, or you can uh, raise your hand, and I will promote you to be a co-panelist um, with our speaker this evening, Dr. Mark, and uh, you can um, interact with him uh, by engaging your webcam and microphone. Um, so let me uh, begin with uh, taking some of our submitted questions. Um, both. Uh, Vladimir Susik and I are uh, dying to know, um, Dr. Mark, your view on the Trinity, because are the three persons of the Trinity not omniscient uh, of one another? Uh, I, well, I think that they're actually one and the same. Um, actually, that, that probably never bothered me, because I assumed that the omniscient be being was indeed the Trinity. And I talked about it as one, and we talked about the Trinity being one, and I guess I always assumed that indeed that was the case. Right, but are the Father, Son, and Spirit not individual persons who are nonetheless omniscient of one another? Well, you know, that's a good question. I think we get into an area outside of my specialty, but I did know that Christ said that uh, he talked about things that only the Father knew, and I'm not sure how that, that folds into this uh, equation. So clearly, uh, Christ, while he was here on earth, was not, was not, omniscient in the sense of God, but certainly he, I, I would believe that he is now. I don't have the scripture of the theological backing to defend that. But uh, again, in my presentation, I assumed that the, that the omniscient being was the Trinity, the three in one. Right. So um, you, you said that you don't believe that Christ is omniscient on earth. Is that what you said? Well, I think that Christ clearly said in a in a some places that only the Father knows. Like in Mark thirteen thirty two and Matthew twenty four thirty six. Yes, yes, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if he's he's hedging the question or whether he's actually saying only the Father knows and I don't know. Right. And if, if the Father knows and I don't know, then all of a sudden the omniscience question needs to be right. But he is omniscient there. I mean, we know. Um, I mean, certainly, for example, in John sixteen, uh, the disciples say uh, to 
Jesus. No, we know that you know all things and that you came from God. Um, and so they thus suggest that he is, in fact, omniscient. And even after the resurrection, uh, Peter says to Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you in John chapter 21. Um, and my, my understanding of Mark 13, 32 and Matthew 24, 36, um, as I try articulated recently in my debate with Dr. Shapiro Ali on the deity of Christ. Um, I, I think that the son was omniscient during his incarnation um, and ministry on earth, but I would maintain that the most plausible resolution is that he was omniscient in his um, subconscious knowledge. So he had exhaustive knowledge in, in his subconscious knowledge, but in his conscious waking knowledge, there were certain truths veiled to him uh, by the Father, as, as Jesus says in John chapter 15, um, you know, a, a servant does not do his master's will, and Jesus self-identifies as the servant of the Father, and so this, the Father veils to him certain truths even, um, in his waking conscious knowledge, even though in his subconscious knowledge he may be, he may possess exhaustive knowledge. Um, so that would be my way of, of um, understanding that, and I think that makes sense in view of the fact that he seems to know all things in John 16 and indeed in John 21 as well. But it's just uh, an interesting question because Vladimir um, from Montenegro also asked if we change Bob and Alice to the Father and Son, would the persons of the Trinity be omniscient over each other? Um, which I think is um, a possible um, critique. Okay. Um, but uh, Brian Marion also asked what about the hypostatic union and omniscience, which kind of relates to the same uh, issue. Um, so I think we've talked about that. Um, yeah, Brian Aaron also asked how does omniscience relate to the Trinity, which is, again... Uh, Same thing, yes. Yeah. Yes. I tell you, that's, that's a question that I really, I really haven't considered in depth. Okay. So I, I can't talk intelligently about it. Sure. I can talk unintelligently about it, if you'd like. Right. Because um, I'm sure someone who takes a Unitarian concept of God, such as a Muslim... Uh, for example, um, who takes a view of Tawheed, which is the idea of the absolute oneness of Allah, that Allah is completely indivisible and limited to one person, may level that as a philosophical critique of the Trinitarian framework. Um, on the other side of the scale, a Trinitarian makes a philosophical critique of Unitarianism by pointing out that uh, you know, if, if love is an essential quality of God, then you know, how, can that qual how can that essential quality be expressed before creation? Because God obviously is not essentially a creator. He's essentially loving. There's possible worlds in which God does not create. No created beings exist, but God, though is the greatest conceivable being, and so is essentially loving. So that requires a plurality of divine persons, which is a, a critique of uh, Unitarianism. Of course, someone might come back and say, well, is mercy not a, um, an essential um, quality of God? But actually, I would argue that mercy is an expression of the essential quality, which is love. Uh, just as uh, just just as um, wrath is an expression of the essential quality of, of righteousness or justice, so um, that would be my um, so you, one can level philosophical critiques um, either direction of Tawhid and and, and, and uh, your um, presentation seems to me to be something that someone could level as a critique of the Trinity. Someone needs to give some philosophical thought to how one might address that. So it's just interesting. Well, I guess I guess on a high level, I would just. Um... Um, on a very high level, we talk about monotheistic uh, religions, including uh, Christianity, including um, Judaism, and also Islam. And I think that this would be embraced by anybody that had monotheism. And then the details about uh, the relationship with Christ and the Holy Spirit it would be something which needs to be addressed and needs to be worked out from the Christian point of view. But again, I would I would go back to my original statement when we said that God, with God, all things are possible. Um, that because of the consistency of God, these strange loops could not exist in the Trinity because of their consistency. So all this quagmire, I don't think, is uh, actually applicable to the interaction of the Trinity. Right, because the, I mean, the doctrine, the doctrine of the Trinity maintains that you know, there's still one divine being. I mean, we affirm the Jewish Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4, uh, Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Akkad. Here, Israel, um, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Uh, there is one divine being. Um, Isaiah 43, 10, 11 as well affirms that there's one divine being. 
we believe that God is, is one in being, but three in person. So he's one, but complexion is unity. Uh, so obviously we, um, we believe in one divine being who is, uh, who is omniscient. Um, but then uh, we, we believe each of the divine persons participates fully in the divine essence. Um, yes. So not, not a third of the divine essence, but 100% of the divine essence, because the divine essence isn't something that's divisible like a pizza. You know, the divine essence is something which is uh, which is uh, infinite in quality. So it's qualitatively infinite. Yeah. Um, not quantitatively infinite, but qualitatively infinite. Um, so it's not something that's divisible. So even though each of the members of the Trinity could be rightfully said to be a third of the triune Godhead, it's not correct to say that they possess a third of the divine essence or quality. Yes. Um, uh, Ribbon asks, uh, Dr. Marx, did you mean to say that the zero must be outside of time in order to avoid contradiction? Wilman Craig, who is a philosopher of time, believes that God stepped into time at the moment of creation. Well, you know, this is a, this is a debate that goes on. I, I would I would mention that William Lane Craig is uh, is at odds with uh, Hugh Ross, who actually believed that God exists outside of time. Um, and so we get into the philosoph philosophical discussion. All that I'm saying is that omniscience, in the manner that I defined it, requires a God that existed outside of time. It's very clear that in the creation of the universe that um, time and space were both created. Uh, whether you go through a Genesis account or whether you go back to a Big Bang account, the physicists also believe that time and space was created. And indeed, if time and space was created, then therefore the creator has to exist outside of space and time. And so certainly God at one point um, uh, existed outside of space and time. I actually, uh, come to think of it, I did a that was addressed in here. Uh, it was addressed in the paper. Okay, if we go to evoinfo.org, which is the website, uh, this is the website that the Evolutionary Informatics Lab runs. Uh, Winston, who is in the audience, is a major participant, as is uh, William Dembski. There is a place where we have publications, and our publications are actually listed topically. One is in Christian apologetics. Uh, we do have the monotheism theory in the hierarchy of uh, inference. So I'm clicking on that. This is the paper that I showed you previously. Now I'm going to do a search for Craig. God's universal omniscient character, therefore, is allowed to exist outside of time and space, and we can fill in an, an eternal, universally omniscient oracle in figure 9, as shown in figure 10. The omniscient oracle, by necessity, exists or has existed outside of time and space. Hugh Ross contends that God existed outside of time, and he explains God's view of time as akin to seeing both the beginning, middle, and end of a movie on celluloid film unwound and laid on the floor. William Lane Craig, on the other hand, argues that God existed outside of time and after creation chose to flow with time. Since God's temporal omniscience uh, prior to creation would still be intact after the transition was made, the interpretation of both Ross and Craig are consistent with the model. So the idea is, is that uh, if God did, uh, th they did decide in accordance to William Lane Craig to flow with respect to time, there was a time, and we have to do air quotes around time, there was a time that he existed outside of time and space because he created time and space. And certainly his knowledge and his omniscience existed then, and that was something which must be maintained by God as he flowed with time. He still had all, that, um, all of that knowledge. So that was, that was the response that was specifically addressed here. Uh, John asks, how can a being outside of space-time interact with entities, people, physical objects, planets in space-time? Well, that's an, inter that's an interesting question. It goes back, when I, was, uh, when I came to Christ as a uh, junior in, in, in college, one of the books that really blew my mind and actually let me believe that there could exist a God 
because I, I used to look around. And I said, well, where is God, the, the entity? That was a book by Flatland by Abbott. And Abbott talks about a, uh, an, infinite, uh, an infinitely flat two-dimensional plane. And on that plane, there was a number of creatures that existed. And these creatures only were knowledgeable about the two dimensions that existed. And then this one scientist had this theory called up. And his idea was that there was a third dimension, but he, went, but he tried to explain it to people. And he said, uh, he said, there is an up. And everybody asked him, well, if there's an up, then where is that, uh, where is that third dimension? And the guy's universe was in two dimensions. What he could do, he could only point north. And I wonder by him pointing north to kind of explain what up was is kind of us pointing upwards to say where God is, that we're kind of pointing north in a three-dimensional sort of space, I, I, I wonder. Um, but then he had a wonderful visitation by a three-dimensional being, and this three-dimensional being said, hey, look, I've been watching you. I, I exist in three dimensions. I'm a sphere. And what you say is exactly true. There is a third dimension, and I'm going to show you the third dimension. So he picked up this uh, two-dimensional being, and the, the, the two-dimensional being's mind was totally blown because he was going over flat land. He could look inside of houses and see people, what they were doing, even though they were inside their two-dimensional houses. He could uh, look inside of people and see what they ate for lunch because he was in a three-dimensional uh, situation hovering over it. And then the, um, then the two-dimensional entity asked the three-dimensional entity a question, which I'll never forget reading the first time. He said, this is really fascinating. Now, show me the fourth dimension. Where is the fourth dimension? And the three-dimensional person being said, well, there is no fourth dimension. Three dimensions is all there is. And this really exposes kind of the limitations of the way that we view things. Now, indeed, if there is a fourth dimension, if there's a fifth dimension, if there's a billionth dimension, and uh, God exists in it, I don't know if that's the case. But if it were the case, God could exist outside of that dimension and interact with us both in time and space. Now, we don't look at time as going back and forward, but let's assume for the moment it does. He could still interact with us in, these, um, in this manner, simply by intersecting our universe, simply the same way that the three-dimensional uh, being was able to interact with the two-dimensional being. So I don't see any limitation of... Uh, uh, an entity outside of time and space interacting with an entity inside of time and space. And I think that the flatland analogy is something which really illustrates that very clearly. Right. Um, Ruben asks, but then God loses his omniscience when he stepped into time. That's not true. No, I think that we've answered that already because God at one time was omniscient. So he knew everything that was, it seems to me, he knew everything that, ha that was going to happen in the history. And then when he stepped into time, God knew everything that was going to happen in time. He maintained his omniscience, even though he was flowing in time. I don't see an inconsistency there. Mm -hmm. Um. So one viewer said, in the first stage of the argument, you had two people who were omniscient, and you proved that this led to a logical problem. However, would this not also be a problem if they weren't omniscient, but just knew each other quite well? And surely we can have two people who knew each other well enough to predict what the other might say. That's true. But I think omniscience uh, implies and necessitates total knowledge. And what we showed with the omniscience is that total knowledge could not exist bilaterally. Certainly, there could be limited knowledge. I mean, how, how do we know that there's a God? If the arrow comes down from God in terms of omniscience, how do we know God? It doesn't mean that we're omniscient over God, but certainly we can know God through Christ and therefore uh, be able to relate to Him, to pray to Him, to understand Him. And just because we have a relationship with Him doesn't mean that we are omniscient over God. Omniscient means total knowledge. Hmm. Uh, James asked if you're essentially just playing word games. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know, th this, is, this is very interesting, and this is the reason that I did the preamble about, uh, about indeed the word games. And indeed, on first viewing, all of this idea of self-refuting, 
sounds like a word game. In fact, they put up the cartoons, which I think are hilarious, uh, that, that show that the self-refuting is very funny. And you do get into word games. But I will tell you, if you get into the area of algorithmic uh, information theory, which is based on this idea of self-refuting, uh, built on Gödel's original idea, uh, it becomes enormously powerful in terms of the deductions you can reach. And it is not a word game. It is reality. Strange loops do not exist in reality. And therefore, we have to, we have to play around with our logic and make sure that these strange loops does not exist. The non-existence of, of, of these strange loops does incredible things. We can show in mathematics now that there are things that exist. We can prove they exist. Yet we can also prove that they're unknowable. Why are they unknowable? Because if they knew, if we knew them, it would form a strange loop. This is in the mathematical literature, and I can refer anybody that's interested into it to this literature. So, no, the strange loops are incredibly serious in terms of mathematics, logic, and the implications of what happens in reality. Oh, Winston Ewart is back. I don't know if Winston Ewart uh, has any comments that he wants to share. Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested too. How'd I do, Winston? <laughs> yeah, he, he actually dropped out for a little bit, but he's, uh, he's returned. I, I will say that uh, in this upcoming book that I have with Bill Dembski and Winston Ewart, these are two of the most brilliant men that I've ever met, that I've ever had the opportunity of working with. Their minds are just so incredibly creative, and uh, boy, it's an honor to, to work with them. Yeah, I would concur with that um, sentiment. Jason McCool says, thanks for the offer to share slides. We'll need some time to digest this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Again, some of the some of the details, I think I showed you the access to the paper. Some of the details are things you just have to sit down and kind of slog through. And uh, they're, even when you get to just three entities, it becomes very, very complicated. I found that... Uh, very interesting that these feedback loops related to the strange loops and the fact that indeed this was a, a relationship i found that very very fascinating mm. <laughs> so winston Ewart says i'm not in a situation where i can do that um mostly i just came back to hear dr mark's post about me <laughs> <laughs> yes winston is also a very modest uh, young man <laughs> Um, HP is also asking, what is strange loops? Strange loops are, are self-contradictory loops. Uh, the one that we talked about was the Cretan and who said, everything I say is a lie. And that can't exist because if everything he said is a lie, he just lied, which means he tells the truth. And if he doesn't tell the truth, or if he tells the truth, then he says he always lies, but if he lies, he's telling the truth. So it's this loop that kind of goes around and around in your head. And those things do not exist in reality. It was used again by Kurt Gödel to overthrow mathematics by his little theorem X that says this theorem can't be proved. It was a self-referential statement that actually showed that all structures are either incomplete or inconsistent. And uh, that, that kind of toppled mathematics. It also shows no matter if we loosely interpret it, means that no matter what assumptions that you have in your ideology, there are going to be some questions which you are either, which you can't answer or you answer inconsistently. Uh, the, 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 the implications of it, I think, are just astonishing. HP is asking, Okay, for the Christian, what relevance do these things have to us in practical application? And that's the, that's the contribution. The idea that omniscience is not uh, theologically uh, vacuous or there, you can't poke holes in it. it. looks to be very consistent. John is asking, can we get out of strange loops by just allowing truth value gaps, neither T or F? I think it means neither true or false. And we get out of strange loops. Well, in fact, that's exactly what we do. If we're confronted by a strange loop, we say, nope, it can't be. So therefore, we have a gap. 
that's the reason that algorithmic information theory that you have you have propositions which can be proven to be unknowable. Why are they unknowable? Because we have to avoid the strange loops. Do you think um, that God's um, exhaustive knowledge of all future, um, all future, all, all things future, so his exhaustive knowledge of time and space, and to, coupled with his omnipotence, would suggest a deterministic view of reality? No. Okay. Why? Would you like? Would you like? Would you like me to elaborate? Yeah. Well, first of all, we get to this idea of uh, of uh, materialism and free will and predestination, kind of the Laplacian Laplacian view of things. Let me uh, let me dig deep in my head here and uh, show this. Well, let me show you one of the places that strange loops happens. Okay, Her, Turing's halting problem says that we cannot look at a computer program and tell whether or not it will halt or not. There was a guy named Rice who generalized this. Now, this, this is kind of mind-blowing in a way that you cannot, you cannot tell if a computer program will do anything. You can't write a program to tell if another computer program will do anything. You can't write a computer program to say whether the program you're analyzing will print out the number three. You can't analyze it to show that it will halt or not. You can't, you can't, do, you can't write a computer program to analyze another program. Uh, in, and predict what, anything that it will do. Now, this to me seems to be enormously mind-blowing because what it says, it says we have a computer program. Somebody comes and they give you a computer program. That computer program is totally deterministic. We're going to assume that there's no random numbers in it or anything, but it's deterministic. There it sits. It's, it's deterministic. Yet, there's nothing we can say about what that program will do. That's non algorithmic even though it sits there in deterministic materialism, we cannot tell what that computer program is going to do. That's the reason I love algorithmic, uh, algorithmic information theory. It is more fun than any of the science fiction I ever read as a kid. It is uh, just the astonishing thing, things that you can do. But the idea that you can have a materialistic fixed computer program, and there it sits, you cannot have an algorithm. You cannot write another computer program to say what it does. So even though it's fixed, it's materialistic, you cannot predict what it, was do, what it will do. And this goes back to Laplace's idea of materialism. He thought if you knew every position and every velocity and every uh, acceleration of every particle in the universe, you could totally predict what was happening. According to Rice's theorem, that's not right. It was still, even though everything was fixed and materialistic, the future was still unknowable. Right. Uh, we actually had a hand raise from David in the audience. So David, you're, you're now live with uh, Dr. Marx. Do you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question? Uh, yeah, so I was um, wondering uh, how the halting problem involves strange loops. Okay, that's, that's actually a very good question. It, it is actually a proof by contradiction. Do you remember the proof that all integers were interesting? It was a whimsical proof, but nevertheless, it, it illustrated proof by contradiction. The halting problem is, is proven by the same methodology. You assume that a halting program exists, that there exists a program that can look at all these other programs and say whether or not they will halt. And then you walk down a a staircase of logic, and you get to the bottom and you find out that there's a contradiction. So indeed, the proof by contradiction is a type of strange loop, if you will. And um, indeed, that's the way that the halting problem is proven. And by the way, if, if you purchase the book, uh, Introduction to Evolutionary Informatics, there is a detailed uh, description in there of the halting problem, if you're interested in, in digging into the, uh, into the details. Great. Is, is that all for me, David? Um, I think so. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, uh, someone says, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Dr. Marx. You're very, you're very welcome. Okay, I think that uh, we can probably begin to uh, Wrap up. Brian Marion also says thanks, Doc, for a great presentation. Thank you. In a real um, 
um, honor and joy to have you on, Dr. Marx, or share your wisdom and insights with us. And we'll be going on YouTube as well. So, well, it's a, it was just great to meet with your group. What a uh, what, what a great structure you have. This is wonderful. Yeah, um, you're very welcome to join us any week for the as a participant as well. I, w I will be. Yeah, great. Or if you'd like to be rescheduled for a future presentation, we can also arrange that. Just let me know. You know. Okay, I will.